on the panel here we have a really diverse and eclectic mix of people um, and I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves in a second but just really quickly um, Benj uh, on the end here young innovative creative photographer uh, videographer editor um, who came into my life about five years ago we were sitting in a shared space in Auckland called the Biz Dojo. Um, Benj was doing a transmedia project for social impact and has done a bunch of cool stuff since then. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing from him. And we have Annie, a uh, wealth of experience in film and documentary, specifically editing, um, coming at a different angle. And, and Billy, Billy here, um, Billy and I have been friends for 26 years. Um, he was the cool guy who came to New Zealand, a small town where I was living called Hamilton from Canada. Uh, turned up with a Canadian accent, everyone thought he was American. He became the cool guy, he used to chew gum, we didn't even really have gum. And played basketball and ended up coaching my basketball team. He's since lived in lots of countries around the world and really coming at this from a how do you communicate across cultures? As an English teacher, how do you use language in order to craft a story that really connects across generations? So I'll leave it at that and um, let the panel introduce themselves and then we'll take it from there. Kia ora whanau. my name is Benjamin Brooking. I hail from Auckland. Um, I was born in Wellington, in this beautiful city. Um, I spent most of my time on the West Coast and have... Um, Really been uh, doing the media thing for my um, for the entirety of my short career. Um, how I got into the social uh, change side of media has been uh, well, it's it's just been opportunity after opportunity that has come to me, and I feel very blessed. And um, I'm very blessed to be here in the surroundings with all of you lovely people, and um, kia ora for your involvement, and uh, kia ora for the Hi, that was beautiful, whoever was responsible for lunch today. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my story is, is quite a short one. I uh, went through university uh, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I was in media strictly because I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and it's quite a broad landscape that you can go into. And I thought I wanted to be in advertising, and I, I really chased that for a while until a... Um, uh, a mentor and teacher of mine sat me down and said I could be doing so much more and I thought what else can I do? I just want to chase dollar signs and um, have some fun. Um, but I was, I was hired uh, out of university to um, work in the space with Rebecca um, in the Biz Dojo in a transmedia um, experiment of a documentary company working for a social change uh, in Auckland and internationally. And that really uh, springboarded the, the sorts of projects that I would find much more fascinating than you could put any kind of dollar signs on. Um, since then, I was involved in youth education. I was uh, hired to research an educational series around um, engaging youth in what they can do with their futures. Uh, following that, I started working with a couple of companies who specialize in content for not-for-profits and for um, government-funded but social, uh, civil society-led uh, promotional campaigns, um, most recently around uh, bigging up the LGBTI community in Auckland and in schools up and down the country uh, so that people can have a wider understanding of uh, what individual peoples like the LGBTI community go through so that we can work together to make sure that people don't have to uh, suffer what previous generations have suffered. Um, so my, my statement this morning was uh, marama, marama is the Māori word for understanding. I'm all about teaching understanding and gaining through it. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, kia ora, everybody. Um, my name is Annie Collins. I'm an independent film editor, and this year is the 40th year that I've been doing this. <laughs> um, I'm also, I, I think I'm probably the first independently trained editor in New Zealand as well. I haven't come through television 
or the National Film Unit or one of the big companies, anything like that. Um, I didn't start out to be a film editor. I had been travelling. I came back to New Zealand. Um, I went to the design school because it was the only place in Wellington where I could do life drawing on a really, really regular basis. I wasn't any good at designing at all, I don't think. And did a bit of film work in the last year. And um, at the end of the year when I graduated, that particular part-time tutor came to me and said, Annie, what do you think you're going to do when you leave? And I said, I don't know, Pat bloody awful designer and he said um, why don't you try editing because I'd been the one who had edited our little film and I said okay no probs and um, I said how do I start he says oh well go off and see whether you can get trained somewhere so I went around the usual places and nobody wanted to know me and I went back to him and said oh Pat nobody wants to know me so you know, what can you suggest? And he said, well, if you can keep yourself alive, I'll train you, because he was setting up the first independent editing service in New Zealand. And, um, and that's what we did. And about a year and a half later, he, um, a very fine editor called Ian John came through Wellington looking for a person who could help out on a on one of the new wave of New Zealand films. This film was called Sleeping Dogs and uh, with a director called um, Donaldson. And uh, Pat said, oh, Annie can do that. I never had, of course, but you know what New Zealanders are like. So off I went to Auckland and things just kept rolling like that. And so I worked for some really fine people in the industry, many of them now did. Um, but the most seminal experience I had came in those first three years, and that was um, I was suggested as an editor for a whole bunch of footage that had been shot in 1981 on an event that occurred in this country called the Springbok Tour. And the uh, director of that was a, a woman called Merata Mitter. And she is possibly the, one of the finest of New Zealand's documentary makers. And we spent a year on that film. And she trained my thinking and my approach to my work because I'm Pākehā and Merata was bicultural being Māori and having to live and operate in the Pākehā world. And I learnt pretty early on that my skills were adequate, but my attitude was not. And so that um, it was a fairly early knocking into shape. And after that, um, all of the work that I have done in this country has been with that grounding that that one particular woman gave me, sitting on one word, and the word is called kaupapa. Uh, and we'll go on to that a little bit later. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's, it's great to be here today. Um, it's funny that um, Rebecca gives me such a nice in introduction about uh, playing basketball together that was many years ago. Not that I'm a very good basketball player at all. I'm not sure how I had the position of being able to coach their team. So um, to, to come to an event like this, I'm actually very humbled to be sitting up on this stage because from the people I've talked to so far, there's some uh, uh, minds in here that are just humming with, with power and uh, with um, experience in media and also storytelling. So to, to be up here on, on stage to, you know, to, to talk about it is really, um, it, it's fantastic to be here. So um, just a, a brief hi history about me is, um, I don't sound like a New Zealander. Obviously, you probably picked that up. Uh, this this broad, sweeping Canadian accent. But with the uh, many years in, in in high school here, and also a little bit of university, I, I've never seemed to be able to kind of kick it kick it out. And it's the, my vowels have become longer, and my 
hours have become harder as, a, as I progressed in my life and then I've just been resigned to it, although many Kiwis will say, oh, so how long you been here for, mate? And it's like, well, you know, I've um, been here for many years now. I guess if there's a term, maybe a Kiwi would be, would be the right <laughs> thing, but uh, the, the fact is I'm probably not, not really from anywhere uh, at this stage. Uh, my home is, um, you know, where I put my head down most, most times, and that's uh, Cambridge right now. Um, over the past years, I've uh, lived in Hong Kong, um, in Germany, and uh, stints, stints here and there, and um, have been exposed to uh, many different cultures. And um, because of those stints in those different cultures and, and teaching, um, I've somehow become obsessed with photography and, and videography. And that came to uh, a head when we, my, uh, myself and my family moved back to New Zealand, and I ran into Rebecca, and I said, you know, Rebecca, I really like to do the video thing, and um, she said, well, why don't you just do it? And uh, I think it's probably like um, when you hear about mentors or, or something like that, you don't really go and say to someone like Ben, Ben, you can be my mentor. And says, sure, Billy, that, that'll happen. But uh, Rebecca's been that to me where she said, come on, Billy, just give me a little bit of, sh of a shove and uh, said, come and do this and try it out. So, uh, yeah, that's where I'm at right now, kind of a, a fledgling videographer, so to speak, a storyteller, and uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about... Uh, how culture affects the truth and um, how videography can help us get our stories out there. So I just thought, start with, with a question, um, maybe for you, Benj. Uh, in your intro, um, there was an area I'm particularly interested in, and I know that you've got some good thoughts, which touched on some of the issues that were raised this morning in the discussion, which is around how do you connect people and tip them over the boundary from engagement to action um, and some of the greatest challenges that we're facing in the world. I know that one of the key issues that resonates with you, particularly from a youth perspective, is climate change. Um, you're a representative of New Zealand youth and climate change negotiations, which he also didn't mention in his very humble intro. Um, and just wondering, you know, through those experiences of seeing what's happening in the world, you know, your perceptions of where we need to go with, with some of these large issues in order to create the change the world needs, how do you see that, that video and um, film, transmedia can, can be a tool uh, and in what ways? Excellent. I could, I could talk about climate change all day. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, taken along with an independent uh, research NGO to the latest uh, climate change negotiations, which were in Lima um, this December just passed. And uh, forming the youth delegation there, I was um, fortunate enough to be the sort of the, the main media uh, representation on the panel. We had um, a broad range of people, uh, student doctors, um, new engineers, uh, activists, all sorts, but I got to really take it on from a, a media perspective. And um, I think that the, 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 the best way to see something happen from uh, a video um, perspective is to know your outcome before going into a project. And for us, the outcome is, uh, while, while it's good to encourage people to make personal changes to their lives, we know that that just doesn't happen on a mass scale with something like a video clip being put on YouTube. What we're trying to do is accomplish understanding. That's our biggest uh, goal with the climate change movement. What we need to um, create is a, a real hunger for political change and the understanding that backs that. So when political change happens, people are there to push it along and to accept it and to know why it's the right choice to make. So we try to make content which will allow people to join the dots. Um, for me, a good example for me is, uh, I'm sure all of you here detest plastic bags. We don't need plastic bags anymore. They're well and truly archaic. However, um, there's been no, uh, nothing in politics to get rid of them. As soon as that happens, there's going to be a tremendous groundswell of support. People are going to understand why plastic bags have to go because there's been so much campaigning around why they're horrible. Um, if you people didn't understand why plastic bags had to go, they would fight it because they just can't agree with something that they can't click with. So what we're trying to do is make the, join those dots for people with um, very uh, interactive messages where they can get behind uh, what's important to them 
through human connection, human connection through video and, and really understand the story for themselves and how it impacts them. Yeah. And I think in order to do that, you would need to understand the complexity of the system and, and a lot around human psychology in order to think about ways that could trigger that, presumably. Absolutely. Um, Knowing uh, what people want is um, most of the battle. Once you, once you understand your own outcome and you can kind of work backwards from there, you do need to apply the psychology around uh, what people will share. Um, for youth, I'm really working on youth here. That's kind of my jam. Uh, youth love to be able to appropriate a message. Youth really respond to things that other youth create. You, you can't really make uh, a message and put it out there unless um, and expect people to share it, to, to take it on so much that they're willing to attach themselves to it and to even click something like share on Facebook. They need to um, know that that's going to align with their own, uh, if I can use brand speak, that's going to align with their own personal brand. That's going to thoroughly represent them. Um, the best way that I find to do that is to have youth creating content for youth because youth innately know what other youth will like and share. And that's why the most popular videos on YouTube and Vimeo are ones that are youth made and um, often appropriated from sources that you don't expect. Uh, remixes are, uh, remix is the most popular content, yeah. Cool. Um, and, and it'd be good to maybe get a perspective from the other end of the spectrum of, um, you know, how we can look at complex systems uh, and use knowledge about how to navigate through those complex systems in order to create content which is meaningful and doing that in a really careful way. And I just had some reflections from our earlier discussion, Annie, around um, the approach that you'd like to take to filmmaking and editing. And, and you said two words to me that you're all about coke papa and chaos. Um, and the balance between the two, and I'm really intrigued by that, and just wondering if you could share with people here a little bit around your approach. Um, picking up from you, Binge, on um, um, the psychology and, and, and knowing, you know, youth to youth, etc. cetera, um, there are two questions that I have for directors. Um, when they walk into my cutting room. Um, and the first one is, what is your co-popper? Uh, which, and the word, um, in very simple terms, means what is your purpose for making this film and, and in what spirit do you approach it? And you cannot use the word co-popper if you are not thinking spirit as well. Um, the second question that I ask them is, who are you talking to? And I often get this um, eerie, fairy reply going, oh, we're going to be talking to the whole world, or we're going to be talking to all New Zealanders. And I sit there with a very jaundiced eye going, oh, yeah. No, you tell me who are you talking to. Just who is it? And the other one, the other sort of reply that I often get for the co-popper is, um, oh, well, we've got this wonderful idea and we'd really like to do this and this and this. And in fact, the answer is about a page long. And I go to them, when you get that down to about this length, then you come back to me because you don't know what you're making this film for. Okay. So you've got to have those things really, really clear. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, having sort of said that, the other word is that, that business of chaos. I read a book on, well, I read most of a book on chaos theory. Um, <laughs> I thought, gosh, this sounds like me. <laughs> um, and it's really interesting. You can, you can go into a project going, I want to do this. <coughs> so you go out and you make yourself a list of what you need to shoot. And you make yourself a list of who you want to talk to. 
and then you go out and shoot the stuff and you shoot all the cutaways that you're going to need and, and you know, you get the interviews and you go back and you do your transcriptions or if you're going to do that or whatever. And, um, and then you get out your paper and you go, there's this bit about this and there's this bit about this and there's this bit about this and we'll start with that shot and then we'll finish with that one and we'll have all these bits in between and it'll all go from there to there and it'll all make sense on paper. <sighs> I don't know how many of those I've thrown in the waste paper bin. <laughs> I never approach a film that way because I don't know what's in that footage and, co and of course I don't know what's in it, I never shot it. But the important thing is, is that often the director doesn't know what's in that footage either. And they won't know if you just follow that, those paper directions, those sorted out directions that you had right at the beginning that somebody had figured out before they even went out to shoot. Um, I cut a film last year, came out in the festival called Ngāri o Te Whenua, The Voices of the Land. And the director came with all this beautiful footage. And one particular thing, he said, oh, don't worry about that. Um, that was the day that we were meant to go up in the chopper over a fiordland and it was bad weather and the chopper didn't work and so we had to take Richard and Nuns into the... We had to all sit in this blimmin' motel room for all day and it was as boring as anything. We just shot a bit of stuff but we'd shot it all elsewhere anyway and it was it was just rubbish. He said, don't bother about it. I said, okay. So when I let him back into the cutting room, <laughs> um, the first thing I showed him, I'll just go a bit further back from that, I don't actually let the, the director into the cutting room with me when I first look at that footage. Because what does the director say when the shots come up? They say, oh, that's rubbish. Yeah, they say, oh, that's rubbish. And they say, oh, now, now what happened? Oh, you'll never believe what happened when we did that shot. Oh, it was so cold, it was so hot, it was so muddy, it, was, it took so long. And I'm going, just go away <laughs> because what they think about the footage is not what I think about it because I carry none of that baggage with me, nothing. My eyes are clean. And so I look at all the material, I log it all. This will take weeks. And then I do my first cut. And I cut this particular sequence that this director thought was rubbish. And I thought, oh, well. And then I called him in after I'd done all this work. And he came in. I said, oh, we need to start looking at all these sequences. And uh, I'll put this one up first. And I put it up. And there was this dead silence beside me. Because what was up on screen was actually the essence of the central character who was bored and impatient and cracking jokes. It was him. And that's what happens when you keep things in chaos. I don't know what the first shot of that film's going to be. I don't know what the last shot's going to be. I don't even know how everything's going to happen right through it. And I work a process that keeps that footage unlocked at least two-thirds of the way. Now, that particular film took four or five months to cut. It's not until we get right down to about the fourth month that I can say, okay, I can feel the shape now. And keeping it in chaos means keeping the creativity 
running. It's it, when you when when the creativity is running, you can feel the energy. Yeah, and. Sounds like you'd be good at sustainability strategy. Just reflections. A lot of a lot of what you're talking about is, you know, with sustainability strategy, you've got to put a whole lot of bunch of information into a central pot where you get a holistic picture, find out the pathways, and then, you know, pull them out in a creative way. So it's really cool. Um, just one real quick question of Billy. Then we're going to have a, a discussion with, you know, we're. we're wanting to keep to time so Billy as far as you know a lot of this discussion is getting to the essence of the story because when we get to the essence of the story things are a lot more powerful we're able to connect with the audience but also the issue that we may be wanting to to profile or raise so just wondering if you've got any really quick thoughts on that before we take it to the floor for reflections excuse me um I think what I don't know uh I take it from my own my own personal point of view. Um, I have a very uh, short short attention span, and um, I think essentially what we want to see on, on a video, or even when we have a conversation, or when someone tells us a story, is to to hear the truth, um, and also humanity. And I think that uh, perhaps a danger in many of these videos that are online um, that isn't done fast enough um, from the outset. I think that. That, that truth can can come in many forms, uh, whether that's a, a voiceover or something uh, that you see. Um, in fact, my mind starts racing uh, today. Uh, I think it's the anniversary of the of the earthquake in Wellington, right? Uh, Two thousand eleven. No, it's not Wellington. I shouldn't say that. Um, in Christchurch, and uh, I can't help but think of a conversation I had with a friend of mine. Who uh, who has parents that live down there, and they're they're out um, in front of their uh, in front of their house, and they're taking pictures. I think they're selling their house. I'm not sure if it was damaged or something like that. Um, Dylan, you know Dylan. Anyways, he's, he's taking a picture in front of his house, and uh, a car comes screaming by and says, er, and and someone screamed out the window, "Disaster tourists!" You know, and um, for Dylan, who's just kind of helping out his friends there or his parents there to take a picture of the house. Someone had taken a, a completely different meaning um, of what he was doing. He's, you know, doing real estate or he's doing an insurance claim or something like that. And this other person, obviously, from from having lived in the area, the the um, took took a different viewpoint on it. And I think in video we have to search for those those different viewpoints for, from from people, and and it takes a bit of time to kind of scratch below the surface. There's a really nice video on that topic. Um, Done by Zoe Zoe McIntosh uh, about the uh, post um, uh, what what happened in Christchurch afterwards and in the opening scene we have these helicopters sweeping down looking at um, very serious damage to to Christchurch and the first sentence uh, that you hear as a voiceover is um, Christchurch earthquakes uh, were the best thing that ever happened to me and you think wow what's going to happen in this video and as you continue to go through the video you see uh, a series of street people whose lives have completely changed, but for the better, because they have now places to live um, in uh, very fancy houses that have been condemned or in um, uh, very, very fancy hotels. So highly recommend seeing that, but I think when you can hit the, the truth and humanity in video, it's a, it's a very powerful thing. Cool. Sorry. And, and just for those who don't know, um, the Christchurch earthquake, 161 people lost their lives um, in, in New Zealand, so a really significant impact on New Zealand landscape. So now we're just going to... From Christchurch, isn't it, this dome? So the disaster relief for Christchurch was coordinated from this dome. Um, and I think that's really quite fitting and, and touching that today is the anniversary of the earthquake and here we are. So thank you for mentioning that, Bill. So just wanting to take um, some minutes, some time for reflections now. Um, either reflections on, you know, storytelling for positive impact or filmmaking, use of short form video, either reflections of what we've said or, or just personal reflections from the day.
Thank you. Um, I have a challenge right now and I'm going to ask all of you if you can help me with this challenge. Um, if, you, if, if somebody said to you, uh, you don't need to spend time making videos, Marianne. Don't waste your time or your money making videos. Just, you know, the information's there. Just send the information to people and then they'll take action. They'll, they'll change their behaviour or they'll engage or they'll... Um, what would your response to that person be? Like, what do you think is the particular power of video or film as a medium for motivating, engaging, um, and shifting people? Um, video is amazing. I don't think any of us are going to disagree with that. Um, YouTube has exploded. Uh, other platforms are doing just as well. Um, I would say to that person, uh, nothing, nothing illustrates the human touch of what we're doing quite like video does on the scale that video can. Um, because we can't go person to person explaining what we want to explain to every single person on earth. But video can get us almost there. It's the best thing we have at the moment. And um, text, text and sound won't quite do it. Um, I personally hate making, well, I, I, I don't make videos these days that, um, that shouldn't be videos. Uh, infographic videos are not my favorite. Um, you need to have the right purpose behind what you're making. As long as that's lined up, then um, video is amazing. It's mind blowing. Um, my question is for Annie. Um, first, Annie, I just really love the shoes and the way that's working with the scarf and everything. <laughs> Solid. The socks. It's just... You got it going on, Annie. <laughs> Dig it. So you've been doing this for 40 years, and I'm just so intrigued by your story, and I'm just curious what you think of sort of um, this idea of short-form video and the modern way that we watch films and storytelling online and through YouTube clips. And as you've been telling stories for this, this many years, what do, you, what do you think of this short way and our, as Bill mentioned, our short attention span and the fact that we have to bang out a story in one minute videos or five minute YouTube clips? Yeah, um, boy, it's a good question. Because, um, I mean, I often go on YouTube and have a look at things and man, the, the clips that are not well crafted, I'm going, no, nah, who's the next one down on the list? And I, and I flip over. Um, basically, I think that short form is, is a beautiful crafted skill to get ideas across in, in such, such a short time. Um, and um, it's to do with the pacing of the concepts that you're dealing with. I'm not talking about the pacing of the pictures necessarily, because a lot of people think, oh, you've got to get something across in a minute. We've got to ch -ch 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 chop, 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 chop. But you often miss the, miss the idea, miss the concept. So that the crafting of one idea into another into another, the, it's, it's a threading, it's a weaving. Um, that, that's the skill that um, I, I, I really respect. And if, if, you can, if you can deal with concepts in that short time and actually get them across, um, then the power of that, and this is answering your question too, is, is just so much greater than a lump of, of written material. I don't read stuff well. I just, I just can't hack it, man, but pictures, yeah, yeah. Matthew, just one more. I have a question for you as well, Annie. Um, you, you talked about the emergent properties of chaos and some of the principles of uh, having purpose and spirit well-defined and articulated. I'm wondering if you have any frameworks that you can share around uh, kind of team models and team configurations, especially as it relates to making a great documentary. Um, and particularly why I'm asking is I'm, I'm really interested in this notion of what it would look like to 
uh, work with a team of people and um, and put together a documentary. And uh, but having zero experience in in it, just uh, just kind of uh, wondering what what advice you would have around how how the ideal team formation might look, and and with a blank canvas, not necessarily fitting within some conventional set of norms and, and roles. It's that word co-papa. If your co-papa is clear, it's truthful. It has no ego inside it. Then everything, every decision that you make or member of your crew makes, is bounces off that co-papa. And if it comes back and it goes, oh, it's veering off down there. What, what, what were we actually on about? It gets pulled back again. So the setting of the co-papa right at the front of a production before you get the camera out, before you start contacting people, to set the co-papa to check it out with the people that, need, that you need to check it out with. It'll be your mentors or the people who are involved in that stuff, whatever, it, whatever your subject is, whatever you want to make it about. That work is done beforehand. That's what I learned off Meritamita, Kopapa. And she would check out. She had elders that she would go to. And they would come by, they would, old men, old women, they'd come into the cutting room and they'd just sit and they'd watch. And I'd be sitting at the back of the room going, I wonder what's going on in their heads because they didn't look like they were sort of, they, they didn't cry and they didn't laugh and they didn't, they just watched. And, but at the end they would feed back to her and I was not present at that feedback. They would feed back to her whether she was on Kopapa or she was not. So that's why I talk about that. And I think whether it's short or it's long, doesn't matter. Co-pop is clear, you're fine. <laughs> cool, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, guys, we're just going to have a short musical interlude to energise us as Yosef will introduce the next speaker. <laughs> 